Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, namaste, good afternoon. And uh, good morning and evening uh, if you are from the different time zone. I'm Adhip, one of the palliative care consultants uh, here at Shokat Khan Memorial Cancer Hospital in Peshawar, which is in the north of Pakistan, uh, bordering Afghanistan. It's an honor for me to be part of this uh, symposium. Uh, uh, the main part of this symposium is that it's online, making it possible for us to uh, attend from around the world uh, without having to face the difficulty that is associated with traveling. Um, you know, COVID, in this COVID, traveling has become difficult. So uh, the COVID seems to have become the part of our lives. And this is what is going to be the main theme of this uh, session today. I hope uh, there will be a lot of learning opportunities and you are going to enjoy. Some housekeeping rules, um, God forbid, in case if there is a fire, you need to follow the instructions in your place. Uh, for questions, comments, and suggestions, feel free to ask. And uh, you have the options to type them in in the question and answer section of the live broadcast. Uh, we'll discuss them at the end in the QA session. Uh, please do fill the evaluation form. Uh, it is not only going to help you in claiming the CPDs, but it would also help us in improving our future sessions. Without any further delay, um, uh, I'll move on to the first talk of the session. Uh, this will be on the toolkit for uh, palliative care con 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 conversations by Dr. Fiona Rawlinson. Dr. Rawlinson is a clinical senior lecturer and program director of uh, postgraduate palliative care education at Cardiff University in the UK. She's also consultant in palliative medicine in the Cardiff University. Our main interests are in palliative care, medical education, innovation, and collaboration. Uh, over to Dr. Fiona Rodinson. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Fiona Rawlinson. I'm a programme director from Cardiff University in Wales. I'm also a consultant in palliative medicine. Mm honoured and, and greatly appreciate the opportunity to be able to once again join the conference. And the focus of this session is just really thinking about a tool all conversations. We're of course talking about palliative care and they're useful for palliative care conversations, but they are actually also useful tools for any conversation in any situation, as I hope I'll be able to demonstrate. So what we're going to do through this session is to consider communication skills tools that help promote effective communication and perhaps to give this an opportunity to reflect on our own personal communication style. There are lots of models about how to collect, conduct a consultation. I'm talking from the UK perspective, particularly from general practice. Roger Neighbours in a consultation remains at the forefront of general practice, but also the ideas, concerns, expectations model from Silverman, Kurtz and Draper, which really just forms that basis for exploring with a patient what, what do they want to bring to this consultation with their healthcare professional. I think though, thinking about palliative care, it's useful perhaps to try to move away from good and bad communication, because palliative care conversations are sensitive, always. They're sensitive for the patient and their family. They can be sensitive for us as healthcare professionals, depending what bits of life we're dealing with. Life happens to us as well. Death happens to us as well. And there are some days when your communication is really effective. And there are some days when it isn't quite so effective. You may have behaviours that don't enrich a consultation, don't explore things. And unless you actually are aware of those behaviours, it could be clicking a pen. That was one of my irritating behaviours. I was informed by a patient. Very useful to know. It means I don't do it anymore. Which areas do you find more challenging? So it's useful to think through these things. We're talking about a patient, but we're also talking about a patient in the context of their family and in the context of other healthcare professionals with whom they're engaged. 
And so not only have you got communication with the patient and family, but also that communication with other people. The patient has to be at the centre of it all. It doesn't matter, though, whether it's a face to face consultation, phone, email, dressed in PPE, virtual consultation. All aspects of communication are important. All need to be thought about all need to be undertaken carefully. Many of you listening and watching will have had experience of being tired, being hungry, being stressed, picking the phone up, sending that email, having that conversation that actually later on you deeply regret because you haven't quite thought it through. So it's really important that we approach communication. It is definitely a skill, but it's a skill that we can all learn and reflect on and will continue to reflect on until we retire and probably beyond that. I think. So what's the Cardiff 6.2 toolkit? This was a collection of communication strategies, if you like. It's not a strategy for breaking bad news. It's not a strategy for handling denial or collusion or uncertainty. It is a collection of tools that are useful in those situations. I'm going to take each of the tools in turn. So one of the tools is comfort. And this is comfort for the patient. Are they in pain? Are they sitting comfortably? Are they psychologically comfortable? Have they got the right people around them? Is the family there? Do they need to be there? Are you comfortable? Are you hungry? Do you need to visit the bathroom? So think around the comfort, the psychological environment, the physical environment. Are you sitting above the patient? Are you standing above the patient? Is the light behind you? Can the patient see your face? Can you see the patient's face? Of course, with PPE, with the mask, that's going to be much more difficult with coronavirus. But attending to as much comfort as you can will ensure that the the groundwork for the ground for that, that consultation will be as good as it possibly can be. The next tool is language. So it's both verbal, it's the words that people use and how they use them. So listen to the language, listen to the words that people might use for cancer, for example. Do they call it cancer? Do they call it a growth? Do they call it malignant? Do you use those words without knowing what the patient will, will, will understand? Nonverbal communication. What are you picking up from the patient? Are they sitting with their, with their arms folded? Are they looking at you? Are they looking at their relative? Are the relatives looking protective? How are you looking? What might people be picking up from you with your nonverbal language as well as your verbal language? So the classical things of trying, trying to avoid jargon, try not to speak too quickly. When we're anxious, we often speak quickly and we don't pause for breaks, pause for silences. So attend to your language, both your verbal language, which might be written, but also your nonverbal language. If you're communicating with the team or with other healthcare professionals on email, for example, if it's going to be a tricky email, a difficult email, sometimes write it, walk away from the computer and read it again before sending. I have a colleague. I have various colleagues who, if I'm writing an email that I'm really passionate about how it might be received at the other end, I will ask somebody to look over my shoulder and it may just be changing one word and that will change the whole emphasis of that bit of communication. So, Lots of aspects about language, but language is important, verbal and nonverbal. Question style is really interesting and helpful. And in general, there are three question styles. And for those of you who listened to the, to the talk on collusion, you'll have heard about this already. So the closed questions, sometimes you need closed questions. Closed questions are yes, no answers. Are your painkillers working? Yes or no. Sometimes you need to ask things in that way to get the answer. Open questions explore things. Tell me about your pain. 
Can you tell me where is your pain? Hypothetical questions are things like some people find, have you ever wondered if? And all of these styles are useful. Colleagues in working in Loughborough University, Ruth Parry and her colleagues, did a very interesting systematic review about question styles that we use in advanced care planning. And they discovered that of all the useful questions for advanced care planning, exploring what people might want for a future when their illness is more troublesome. Closed questions don't tend to yield anything, which kind of one can understand. You might think that open questions are useful, and in some situations they are. The trouble is sometimes open questions can be too intimidating and threatening because they open up a whole area of communication that may still feel very unsafe. And there's so much to think about that there's not a kind of a framework for somebody who might be a little bit anxious to think. So although they might have their uses, sometimes for really sensitive communication, hypothetical questions are the most effective. Notice I say the most effective. I'm not saying the most best, I'm saying the most effective because we need them to do something for us. So some people find that when they're less well, not if they're less well, when they're less well, it's helpful to have a bit more help in the house. Some people find that when they haven't got very much energy, actually bringing a bed downstairs can help. Some people find, have you ever wondered if, so all of these question styles are important, but they each have their usefulness. Remember, tools are as useful as the skill of the operator. So us, it's up to us to get familiar with which of these question styles work in different situations. So actually having our own reflection on communication and our communication style is really important too. These are six really important letters. They spell lots of different words, but they spell two words in particular. One of those is silent, and the other of those is listen. And you can't listen without being silent. And I know that might sound really obvious, and apologies if it sounds patronising. It isn't in any way meant to be. But I know when I'm anxious and a little bit stressed and a little bit nervous in a, communicate, in a consultation or when I'm talking, it's very easy to talk through the silences. But then it means we're not listening. So we need to be listening for 80% of that consultation and talking for 20. That's quite hard. And I don't pretend that I get that ratio every time. I don't at all. But if it's a particularly sensitive or highly charged consultation, an important consultation, perhaps I'm, I'm spanning that actually this treatment is now not working. You know, you've or you've decided you're not going to go for further surgery or chemotherapy or you're not going to go and see the cardiologist again. I understand you're not going to go and see the cardiologist again for your heart failure. Can you tell me a bit more about that? I then need to be quiet because I need to hear what that person is saying. Of course, virtual consultations and telephone consultations. Listening is particularly hard, particularly phone consultations, because you've got no visual cues at all. And even in virtual consultations, sometimes there's that little tiny bit of delay. But things are what they are. We just have to adapt the tools to use in those situations. And if you're doing a phone consultation, listen up, because usually before somebody is going to speak, there's a rustle. They move slightly as they take that breath in and speak. So if you listen really carefully, sometimes you will get a cue as to whether somebody is sitting absolutely still or whether they're starting to move. I think listening can be a real skill. Showing that we're listening is also really important. And you can do that by nodding, by ming. You just have to be a little bit careful that you're not interrupting the flow. Sometimes I know I say, okay, 
quite a lot or mm, quite a lot but sometimes i'll interject that before the person has finished speaking and the, then things don't flow particularly well so just a little bit of caution on that score if you do have a moment of silence the other way to think about it and to stop yourself from rushing headlong into filling it is to think in counseling terms often people talk about having a bowl and the silence is the bowl and usually what comes into the silence is really important so if it can be the patient who speaks into that silence or the other person you get a really good feeling for actually what they're thinking and what's going on and then another useful tool which we don't use as often as we might is reflecting back a word or a phrase so somebody might say i've been feeling really tired lately and you could say oh so can you tell me a little bit more about that which may well yield lots of information but actually, if you just reflect a word, so the patient says, I've been feeling really tired lately. Tired? That's doing two things. That's asking the patient to explain a bit more. Very open question, very open way to ask that question. But it also demonstrates to the person that you have been listening and you have picked up a word that they've said and want to know more about it. It's a very powerful tool particularly in sensitive conversations. The other thing you can reflect is what you're seeing and what you're hearing, two really useful phrases to keep in your head. So going back to the silence, sometimes people find, here's me with a hypothetical question, sometimes people find that actually the silence, at what point does the silence start getting uncomfortable? And you may find that you have to try and interject that silence but rather than going on to the next thing actually say something like you're very quiet i wonder what you're thinking you haven't said anything over the last minute or so what are you thinking at the moment can you tell me what you're thinking is there anything else i can explain or help with have, have you understood things so far am i going too fast but reflecting back that you've noticed their silence, again, you're doing two things. You're reflecting what you're seeing in front of you, but also you're acknowledging that you are paying attention. Your mind is fully in this space with the patient and the family. I had the great privilege to interview somebody who um, had got a 16 year old with a very, very rare cancer. And this family had saved up money and had traveled the world. So they'd gone to experts in South Africa, in Geneva, in New York, in London, in Boston. They'd gone absolutely everywhere to get the most, they're probably one in thousands of cases, very, very, very rare case. And the mum of the patient who I was interviewing, it was interviewing for an educational program, just said, I can tell when I go into a consulting room whether I've got your attention or not. I'm there for 15 minutes of your day. I need you. I don't need the trouble with your family or what your last patient had or what you're going to say to your ward sister or your colleagues. I need you, all of you, in this space with me because I've traveled a long way to get here. So just making sure that we are fully focused on what's in front of us is really important. And summarising. Summarising is such a useful tool. You can do it at the end of the consultation, but it's really useful during a consultation. If you get stuck and you're not quite sure what to do next, if you've got information overload, if the patient or relative is giving you so much information, you're just thinking, I, I can't, I can't. I can't process all of this, you're going too fast. So, simple way of summarizing. So, what we've talked about so far is, can I just check I've got this right? You've talked about your pain, your sickness, your worry about your family, the da 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 da. Again, what that's doing is demonstrating that you're listening and that you want to stay focused. 
So think about summarizing not only at the end, but actually it's a really useful tool if you're getting a bit stuck in the middle. So the Cardiff Six Point Toolkit, as it's called, they are tools. They've all got their uses. A tool is only as useful as the skill of the operator. Paul Workman always blames his tools. That's a saying we've got in the UK. So perfecting your use of these different tools by reflection, by asking a colleague to comment, by having that reflective practice outlook, we, don't, we won't get it right all the time. There'll be times when our communication, I'm not going to say it's bad or it's wrong because everybody has bad days, but there will be days when your communication flows, it's effective, you can see by the response and the patient and the relative that it's doing the right thing and you're, you're working together. And there'll be days when, for whatever reason, it's not effective. You've got blocking behaviours, whether you're having a bad day, whether things are happening in your own life, whether you're just hungry, you've missed your last meal, or you've got a ward that's full of patients and actually this was a consultation that you didn't really quite have time for. So there will be days when it's not as effective as it could be. And that's just useful not to beat up about it, but just to say, OK, is that because it's me? Or is that actually, did I use, could I, could I have used silence a bit more? Could I have reflected things back a bit more? Actually, was I, was I uncomfortable? Could I see the patient was uncomfortable and I wasn't able to do anything about it? But that reflective practice approach is really helpful. I think it wouldn't be 2021 without just mentioning a little bit about COVID, but also the fact that the toolkit is really helpful for COVID as well. Little things like comfort, if you're in PPE, have you warned the patient and the family that you're going to be wearing a mask? You know, we travel around Cardiff doing community visits. We warn people that we're going to be wearing a mask. We warn people we're going to be in the city hospice bus, the minibus with a logo on the outside. Of course, people with death are finding these masks really difficult. Is there another way that you can communicate? Do you actually need to go back to base and do a virtual consultation? Is that safer? if somebody is able to manage the technology. Your non-verbal communication is in very sharp focus. People can't see your mouth, but they can see your eyes and your eyebrows, and they'll know whether you're smiling or not. Question style, not really any change. Listening, reflecting back, not really any change. Summarising, perhaps more important than ever, just because people might have missed some of the things that you've said. Virtual and phone consultations, we've talked a little bit about this before as well. Again, comfort, who's in the room with the patient? Who can't you see or who can't you hear? That's really important. Is this the right time? Think psychological safety. Is this the right time to have that conversation? Are they driving? Think about going in and out of a consulting room. Going in and out of a virtual and a phone consultation is just the same. We need the same introductions. It needs the same attention to detail. Again, on, on, a, on a video consultation, your nonverbal is in really sharp focus. So where are you? What's behind you? Have you got patient names behind you? Silences are harder to judge. Question style, not really any change. Reflecting that, not really any change. Silence and listening, as we've said, needs a little bit more attention. And again, summarising, more important than ever. Just very briefly, the toolkit has got wider applications as well. So if you're in a team situation, if you're in a conflict situation, if you're in a leadership situation, think about behavior styles, question styles, the tools, think about how to use them that might get the best out of, for example, a leadership situation, or reflect back afterwards, after a meeting, how did that go? Hmm. Did I use comfort? Could I have reflected back? Could I have shown I was listening a bit more? All of these different communications, um, different uh, uh, situations, the tools of the toolkit will help. And they're also really helpful as a reflective practice tool. So one of the hazards, classic, wrong tool for the wrong situation. You don't listen, you don't reflect back, you don't summarize, you're too busy to summarize. 
time that that time is not well invested in that case you're never too busy to summarize it's it's, it's one of the most useful tools you need more practice using a tool for example managing silences you're not paying attention to how the tool's being used so just it's it's classic just like workman think think of it in in that situation and just useful again we all have bad days we all have days when our communication is not effective but what we need to be careful of is that we're not developing bad habits and we need our colleagues to tell us if we develop bad habits we will develop habits terribly easy to develop a bad habit um or so much not perhaps, perhaps bad is not the right word it's very easy to develop habits that hinder communication that's the better word that's me thinking of my language that hinder communication that block communication so actually being brave enough to ask colleagues after a consultation how do you think that went do you think i could have played that a different way that can be really valuable if you can collect the psychological safety around you enough to do it Try to avoid phrases like, don't worry, it'll be all right. I know how you feel. We are wired to be compassionate, but we aren't that person. And people will worry. And unless they're looking forward to death, and you know exactly how death is going to happen, how do you know it's going to be all right? So try to avoid, try to reframe your compassion and your care in a different way. Instead of don't worry, perhaps say, we'll do all we can to try and keep these symptoms under control for you. A classic example is getting rid of pain. We'll do all we can to get rid of your pain. That would be great. But actually, in my experience of being in palliative care since 1993, there are some pains that we will never get rid of. They're too complicated. I can bring them down. So they're two out of 10 rather than seven out of 10. But that ache will always be there. The ache of loss, the ache of grief will always be there. So think about the phrases that you use. And as we said, don't forget, think about effective communication can be challenging due to factors for the patient, for the professional, what's going on around you. And the classic thing is, what do you look for? If the conversation is not being effective, what do you look for? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? So we've thought about some tools to help, and I hope I've just given a little bit of, if you like, curiosity, excitement about continuing, no matter how old you are, how experienced you are, continuing to think about your own personal communication style. So things to think about, where are your areas that you feel you might need a little bit more work on, and how are you going to address those areas? What areas of learning do you want to develop further? Thank you so much for listening. Really looking forward to the sessions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rawlinson. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, the six key uh, tickets, uh, comfort, language, listening, and the fact that summarizing. Uh, the next talk is going to be on challenges that we face uh, during this uh, COVID. 19 pandemic in communication. Uh, this would be with a case presentation. It's going to be by me. Uh, I'm going to start now. Right. What do you think I was just doing? Oh, you can choose uh, out of these expressions. Right. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Atif, one of the consultants in palliative care medicine here in Peshawar at Shukar Khan Memorial Hospital, Pakistan. Uh, I'm going to say something on communication in palliative care. Uh, that's during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, well, um, 
I had some facial expressions when I started. Uh, you would have made up your mind. Uh, how would you have responded to that? If you thought I was just daring, uh, you could have corrected me. And if you thought I was concentrating on some work, uh, you could have ignored me. Or if I thought, if you thought that I was angry, then you could have discussed the issue with me uh, with a possible solution. So, and you could have thought of some uh, non-verbal cues, um, took some help from the non-verbal cues and looked at the situation and then would have responded. And wh why do you think this is important? You could see that my uh, mouth and nose, more than half, my, uh, half of my face is covered. So it tends to hide the emotions. And it is very difficult to recognize the exact emotions. And this is, this is the particular problem when you are dealing with a stranger. So what would happen then if you're not able to recognize the emotions correctly? You can misjudge. And so your response would be different. So in my case, if, uh, if you thought I wasn't angry, I was just staring and you would have corrected me. So what would have been my response in that case? So you could now imagine, so what's the importance of this thing nowadays? Let's move on to the another exercise. I'm not going to remove the mask. This is not a new normal. Look at me down there. So <clears throat> what do you think the uh, rest of my face would look like? Well, though, for those who know me, uh, it's not difficult. But for those who are looking at me for the first time, uh, well, I leave it with them to think whatever they like. And I'm talking about this because I think it's very important. It's very important in identification. This is the problem when I face. Uh, I faced when I used to go to the cafeteria uh, and see any of the new joiners. I wouldn't be able. I wasn't able to recognize them uh, when they were not wearing the mask. And I think you would have come across uh, uh, phones with the uh, face ID. They wouldn't open or work if you have got a mask on. Although they have now go nowadays got some alternate uh, solutions for using the face ID. But what I'm trying to stress here that facial expressions, looking at the whole face is important in communication. The whole grammar actually lies in the face. And this is what COVID has done. It has affected our emotions, identification. And as you are not able to identify or recognize the emotions, our responses could not be that accurate. And this has affected the social interactions and particularly expressing empathy. And you could see these are all essential parts of the communication. This is me, uh, mind you, I, I wasn't coming out of the room I was actually about to go into the room of the patient. So you could see what I was wearing. Beside face mask, there is a face shield. And, 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 and if, you, if, if I'm wearing the face shield, there could be a glare coming from the light. So it's not easy to recognize the facial expressions. And apart from that, I'm wearing the gown and the gloves. So gown and gloves has got another problem. It has affected the touch, the human touch, it's a, which is a fundamental human need. 
as it has got a positive impact in reducing stress, anxiety, and isolation. So when you touch someone with a glove on, they might get a feeling that they are untouchable, but they are not clean. Someone correctly said there is no hugging someone if they are crying and distressed. It feels very weird. It does. So the other thing that we have to do nowadays is social distancing. So we are not having a normal contact with our patients and their families. We have to maintain a six feet distance. We are sometimes rather many a times behind the phones, behind these computers. And we have to stay away. I mean, where all those things when going when we are going to see the patients in isolation. And apart from that, we are under stress. We have increased anxiety and we face depression. And that's all because we feel that we are at increased risk of infection. We can in turn spread these infections to our loved ones. So this fear is leading to stress, anxiety and depression. And we aren't seeing doctors and healthcare professionals just dying. So these are the reasons that's adding to the stress. So COVID has brought some additional barriers like the PPEs. Sorry, I haven't removed my mask. I can remove it around me. Um, so it has brought some barriers like PPEs. It, so social distancing, the family cannot come around for meetings and we have to increasingly use the telecommunication and mediated platforms for communication. The fear, stress and workplace phobia are other issues that we are facing nowadays with communication. You could think of other barriers. This is what I see. And this is what we have been facing since the COVID came to my came to us back in December 2019 and then hit our country in February 2020. It came to my city in 2020 March. We all knew at that time that there is no treatment, no cure, and no vaccine. The other problems we were already facing were the limited resources and poverty as 1.2% of the GDP against the recommended 5% goals for health. So I would now come to the case that I would like you to uh, concentrate on. So this is about a 76 year old diabetic gentleman who had an uncontrolled diabetes, as you could see, his HbA1c was uh, 9.6. He was suffering from hormone refractory adenocarcinoma of the prostate. And that had spread to lungs and the nodes. He had surgery back in 2014 and was on follow-up, but is going PCP, PSA continued to rise uh, despite being on antiandrogenic treatment. He was given eight cycles of docetaxel, chemotherapy, and baroteron. But unfortunately, his disease continued to progress. His ACOG status was two. He came to the emergency with a three day history of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. He was a hypoxic on arrival apart from being tachypneic and tachycardic. Being an emergency, what would you do out of the two options? Would you go for an ABC approach, blood test, chest x-ray, COVID PCR, and admit him for an IV support? Or would you just make him an DNR and go for ward birth care and get the palliative team on board? That really depends on the situation that you're in. But as an acute medic, 
I would probably consider active treatment initially. Somehow he refused the NIV. He was trying to leave. He was removing the IV access and was not letting the oxygen mask on. He was in isolation, but with one of his family member who came in with him and refused to leave. He was rapidly deteriorating with severe COVID pneumonia and he was also developing renal failure. What would you do in this case? Would you try to restrain him chemically or physically? Or would you try to orientate him, counsel him and treat the cause, including moving to ICU? Well, what our team did involved the palliative care team. So we were involved. The issues that we had to face was that the son wasn't leaving as this was against the hospital policy of no relative or attendant with the COVID patient. Another of his son wanted to come in as well. And they all wanted to have active treatment to continue, including their father, to be moved to ICU. What do you think is the biggest challenge now? Is it the refusal to withdraw treatment with the demand for a more aggressive treatment? Or is it the presence of his own family member? I think both. What do you think should be done now? Should we as palliative care refer them back? Should we just discharge them and ask them to go to another facility? Should we go for active treatment? Or should we just listen, think, and respond and treat the symptoms accordingly? Well, what we did, we held meetings. They were face-to-face -face as one of his sons was there. And over the phone with the, with another of his son. So we tried to address their queries. As you could see, they had these fears. They thought that they would, their father would be killed with a lethal injection. They also thought that we would withdraw all the treatment, including oxygen, fluid, and nutrition, and this would lead to a painful death, which wasn't the case. So, we continued to hold meetings. We had discussions with the family. It included telephonic discussions. When we had face-to-face -face discussions, we had to make sure that the staff presence in the room was to the minimum. We made ourselves available. One of the thing that we did, and I think it made a difference, was that we started addressing the needs of the carer. We discussed the emotional distrust that he was going through. And he felt there that we are not looking after only the patient, but the family. So it helped us in making the family understand that we need to listen to what the patient wants and respect his wishes. You could see that I've written filial piety. So this is very common here in our country where every child has got an obligatory duty to look after their parents when they're old. In order to help the family understand, we involve the psychologists, we involve the infectious disease team. We help the hospital management understand that he, the son who was there with him has been with him for the last six days. So it was very clear that he would have had the full exposure to the disease. And if he would have had 
allowed him to leave the hospital. It could have had only dire consequences of spreading the infection. So we took the opinion of our pulmonologist and we allowed also encouraged the family to speak to anyone of their choice. We gave them time to think, but in the meantime, we made sure that we add and give the anticipatory medications for patients' comfort. Finally, they agreed, so we withdrew active treatment. We started them on, started him on symptom management and symptom treatment. We adjusted the fluids as well as the patient's needs and we requested the family to address the patient's spiritual needs. We did start them, start him on palliative sedation and he died peacefully in presence of his son and rest of the family on the phone. His son was particularly advised to have himself tested and to stay in isolation for 14 days to which he agreed. We learned a lot of things. This was our first case. We didn't know what to do. We went by the flow, but we had, but we made sure that we provided optimal care for a good death. And at the same time, we did our best to prevent the spread of infection. It was difficult as we had to wear the PPEs, the personal protective equipment, and we had to maintain social distancing. And you know, these were coming in way of communication, which is the core of palliative care. So we did our best to adapt to these PPEs and social distancing. Every time we met the family, we tried to maintain social, we tried to maintain eye contact. We made sure that we could recognize and understand the facial expressions behind the face masks. We had to make sure that we maintain or understand the voice tone and the body language. Where we couldn't express our emotions, we expressed them in language and in, with the help of an uh, appropriate voice tone. We also need to keep in mind, this is for every patient that you come across with severe COVID in the communication, that you recognize the family's feeling their sadness and anxiety. You need to make sure that you deal with them politely. You speak to them slowly and clearly. You select the words very carefully, avoiding the jargons. You may have to be very focused and keep in mind that you avoid multitasking and distractions. You have to be honest and, and at times you have to be there even after the death patient. You had to make sure that you show sim sympathy and you stay attentive and be a good listener. And it is very important that you do not allow work stress to impact your communication. Wherever it is possible, you could use telephone, video call or email to communicate with the family. These ways of communications are good, but you have to keep in mind that you you may you, you'll have to be very considerate and be a good listener. You would have to concentrate on the voice tone and make sure that you do mute your mic when you are not speaking. With every discussion or important discussions, you have to make sure that the person you are talking to has got the message. You may have to repeat the same thing again. With all these things going on, you should not forget your team. And if needed, 
you may have to provide a psychological support. Whenever going to the room, you have to make sure that the only, only one person goes into the room unless it is necessary. So we have come to a new normal. In this new normal, you have to adopt yourself. You have to find out what works best for your patient. Nonverbal cues are important. Face-to-face -face interaction may have to be kept to the minimum. You may have to allow extra time and put in more effort. But do not forget to support your team. In this COVID pandemic, we have learned something new, which we will all probably carry in future, and that's the virtual visits. With this, I end my discussion. If you have got any queries, suggestions, and comments, you're welcome. I'm going through the references that I've used here. Thank you. Right. Uh, someone was very kind enough uh, to say that I was kind of syncopating. Uh, I'm not going to comment on this talk. I hope you would have learned something and enjoyed. Uh, I would uh, request you again to fill in the evaluation form as it's going to help us uh, in uh, seeing what we did and improve in the future. And it's going to help in the CMS. The third talk is uh, going to be on uh, a dying patient with severe COVID-19. This will be by Dr. Mohammad Atif Fakar. Dr. Mohammad Atif Fakar is an assistant professor with joint appointment with the Department of Internal Medicine and Pharmacology at the Al Khan University Hospital in Karachi, a poor city in the south of Pakistan. He's also the section head for palliative medicine services at ATUH and has been uh, instrumental in developing uh, multidisciplinary palliative care services across various domains of care uh, in the institution. Many thanks, Dr. Bakar, for joining us today. Over to Dr. Bakar. Good afternoon and assalamu alaikum. My name is Atif Wakar. I'm a palliative care physician and the chief of palliative medicine services at the Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi. And today I have the privilege of sharing with you our experience in providing care to a lady who was critically ill and dying from COVID-19 infection. And we encountered a lot of uh, challenges in terms of communication with the patient, with the family members and with the the primary team that was providing care to that patient. Um, and some of those challenges I'd like to highlight in our case discussion today. So just to slide on my disclosures, I've got no conflicts of interest and I've got no financial relationships to disclose. Uh, hopefully during the course of my case presentation today, I'll be able to share with you the barriers that we encountered in terms of providing effective communication to the critically ill patient and her family. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to review some of these challenges uh, in communication, especially around uh, withdrawal of care in a dying patient. And then I highlight some of the strategies that me and my team were able to utilize in order to overcome these communication barriers. Uh, so in, in full disclosure, um, in addition to being a palliative care physician, I'm also a geriatrician, and uh, I've been providing care to this 65-year-old uh, housewife uh, for the last uh, five years, and um, uh, she has overall been very healthy. Uh, her past medical history is only pertinent for hypothyroidism and osteoarthritis of her knees, and she underwent a total knee replacement bilaterally a couple of years ago. Uh, her performance status has been very well. She's been very independent in both of her AADLs and IADLs. And um, 
uh, I got a call from from the the patient's family members the other day that she tested positive for COVID, uh, even though she had uh, received her COVID uh, vaccination eight weeks prior. Uh, her symptoms initially to start off with were were very mild. She had a little bit of rhinorrhea, um, cough, uh, sore throat, uh, mild body aches, but nothing too severe. Um, and she had a low-grade fever that gradually increased in intensity and severity. Uh, so when she tested positive, uh, we did do some serological markers, her D-dimer, CRP, ferritin, her white cell count uh, at baseline, and, and all of them were, were fairly normal. Uh, so we decided that we were just going to treat her symptomatically at home. And uh, the, the patient and her family members, they kept in touch with me through teleconsultations. Um, unfortunately, a week into the febrile episodes, um, she started to develop some exertional dyspnea. And uh, we'd been monitoring her vital signs uh, very regularly at home. And uh, unfortunately, she started to develop hypoxemia. So her oxygen saturations on rest, they started to plummet anywhere between 92 and 94%. Uh, she was otherwise alert, awake. She was oriented times four. Um, so we decided at that point, in addition to, to medications for symptomatic relief, uh, we'll start her on some supplemental home oxygen therapy. And we titrated her oxygen levels to keep them above 94% in all times. Um, in the following days, unfortunately, her hypoxemia and her work of breathing, it progressively started to worsen. And uh, it's at that point um, that... Uh, Myself and uh, uh, her family members, we had a very in-depth conversation with the patient, um, explored her goals of care, went through um, you know, the possibilities of what um, the treatment uh, in terms of moderate to severe COVID entails, and uh, we tried to elicit her preferences as well. Uh, the the difficulty um, and, and something that is uh, uh, not very uncommon, especially in, in our uh, culture, in our society, in this part of the world, is that um, the, the patients, they tend to defer to either their spouses or their adult children for decision making. Um, and um, uh, often they delegate the, their... their uh, autonomy to their loved ones. And, and this case was no different. So even though we would keep her apprised of her situation, we would uh, explain to her in detail what was going on. Um, anytime we brought up advanced care planning with her, she would immediately defer to her children. Um, her children, um, uh, uh, she had, uh, she has five children and uh, um most of them were physicians. Most of them were physicians that were practicing abroad. Um, uh, one of her, her um, uh, adult son was a, an orthopedic surgeon um, working in the NHS in the UK. Um, another was a family physician in, in Australia. And uh, one of her daughters is a radiation oncologist uh, uh, practicing here. So uh, all of them were were very um, uh, very much understanding of of what was going on at that point, and and uh, given uh, the 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 fact that her overall health prior to the COVID infection was uh, uh, exceptional, and she was completely independent. Um, they wanted to give her a trial of uh, aggressive and invasive treatment with the hope that this was potentially reversible and that she would overcome this. So um, when her, her hypoxemia started to, to get worse, we did bring her into the emergency department. Um, at that point, she started to develop some respiratory distress. So um, the, uh, the emergency department uh, admitted her to the uh, COVID isolation unit, and we 
began treatment for her along the lines of critical COVID pneumonia with a superimposed community acquired uh, pneumonia. Uh, she was on high flow supplemental oxygen, anywhere between five to eight liters uh, through face mask, started her on broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics, uh, intravenous corticosteroids, and uh, brief periods of non-invasive mechanical ventilation. So initially we started off with BiPAP and later we switched to CPAP. Uh, so she was in the high dependency, the special care unit um, of our institution. Um, but but um, unfortunately, despite uh, a good 24 to 48 hours of the, the treatment, um, she uh was not improving and actually her hypoxemia was worsening so the infectious disease team um, decided to start antiviral treatment with remdesivir for her and she received that on five consecutive days um, and she was also receiving daily prone positions in fact uh, uh, she received uh, 18 sessions of prone positioning uh, during the course of her hospitalization but despite the prone positioning, unfortunately, we were not getting a, a clinical improvement in her. Her respiratory distress uh, continued to increase. Uh, she went up to 10 liters of supplemental oxygen, and then the infectious disease doctors elected to give her uh, monoclonal antibodies, interleukin-6 receptor antagonist, the tocilizumab, to decrease the severity of her cytokine release syndrome. Um, unfortunately, despite all of these aggressive measures, um, her clinical condition continued to, to deteriorate and uh, she was on continuous non-mechanical ventilation. At that point, uh, it was elected to transfer her care to the ICU and to see if, if she would benefit from a... Um, a short uh, time limited period of uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, during this course, again, we continued to have uh, discussions with the family members, with the patient. Uh, progressively, as her hypoxemia was worsening, unfortunately, uh, she started to become obtunded. Um, uh, she had a uh, few periods of, of uh, lucidity, but for the most part, she was delirious. So. Um, all of the decision making, unfortunately, was delegated to the family members. Uh, constant um, uh, discussions with the the primary team and the ICU team, and all of them were fairly optimistic that uh, with a brief trial of uh, mechanical ventilation, there was a high chance that she would be able to recover from the acute insult. And uh, they um, they did feel that their uh, success rate in terms of extubation was also fairly high. Uh, so she did undergo mechanical ventilation and elective intubation. Um, but because of the tocilizumab that she received, she developed thrombocytopenia. She started to bleed from her mouth. She had a lower GI bleed as well. So she received uh, blood transfusions uh, for uh, the loss of blood as well as platelet transfusions as well. Um, and then um, she developed a cascade of complications, which is very common, what we see in our practice. Uh, she went into septic shock. She developed hemodynamic instability. She was placed on vasopressors, uh, initially on norepinephrine, and then later on, she also received dobutamine. Her uh, ventilatory parameters continued to increase. Her IOTU was uh, 80%. Her PEEP was anywhere between 10 to 12 percent, and uh, this continued to, to be escalated, but her respiratory status was not improving. And then suddenly, because of the bare trauma from the, from the CPAP and from the uh, mechanical ventilation, she developed pneumomediastinum and pneumopericardium with some subcutaneous emphysema. So the... Uh, uh, the cardiothoracic surgeons uh, were consulted and they felt very strongly that um, doing uh, bilateral chest tubes may actually relieve the respiratory uh, compromise that she was suffering. And, uh, and the, the team actually went ahead um, on the 
23rd day of her hospitalization and put in these bilateral chest tubes. Unfortunately, despite all of these very intensive, very aggressive interventions, um, her overall condition did not improve. The following day, she developed uh, arrhythmias, both Beretti and tachyarrhythmias, and then she had a massive uh, uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Her troponins were in the thousands. And in light of all of these um, uh, worsening clinical markers, uh, multi-organ disease, and then she started to go into multi-organ failure. Um, we we had a, a detailed discussion with the with the family members and with the primary care providers, and uh, and we elected to to move forward with a do not resuscitate order. Uh, the family felt very strongly that they did not want to withdraw care because it was very difficult and very challenging for them to do that. So uh, we put in a DNR with the explicit orders that there was not going to be any further escalation of treatment. And then we would just allow nature to take its course at that point, which it did um, uh, with no further escalation in her treatment and with the multi-organ failure that she was experiencing, unfortunately, the lady succumbed to her illness uh, the very next day. So some of the, the challenges that we encountered in, in terms of communication were uh, how to streamline communication with the primary team that was just constantly in flux. Um, we, um, we have a rounding model here in our ICU where the ICU teams, uh, because of how uh, challenging the care um, is to provide to COVID patients, they've got a weekly rounding schedule where each week the attending physician and the team changes uh, so that there's not a lot of burnout and a lot of um, uh, stress uh, for our inpatient rounding teams, but each time the the teams would change and a new team would come in, um, they would have a completely different treatment plan. And uh, at times we found that there was uh, challenges uh, in terms of uh, um, consistency and, and providers. Um, everyone had different tools that they were using for prognostication. Everyone had a different outlook in terms of her prognosis. Um, so we were we were constantly getting mixed messages, and um, the family members and myself we would sit down together um, and have these family meetings together with the with the ICU team. But despite me being there as uh, the the sole provider uh, for continuity of care, we still had a lot of challenges in terms of of uh, streamlining the communication from the ICU team. A second challenge was um, in, in our patient's case where she delegated her autonomy to her loved ones and the loved ones were trying to do the best that they could uh, um, for, their, for their mother. Um, it was very challenging to provide advanced care planning. Um, how do we respect and honor the patient's preferences in this situation, especially since uh, they came into the hospital thinking that this was potentially reversible? The patient was um, um, constantly engaged in these uh, goals of care discussions, but every time we would ask for her preferences, she always delegated to her children. And then her children thinking that this was potentially reversible and treatable, they always um, wanted to give her a time-limited trial of aggressive treatment. So unfortunately, we ended up going through uh, a number of very painful, uh, very invasive uh, treatments. And the end result, unfortunately, was that she um, did not survive and she succumbed to her illness. Um, one of the reasons why it took so long for us to get to that DNR status um, in so many days was because all of her children were healthcare providers, some of them here um, and others um, in the UK and, and in Australia. And uh, all of them were sharing their own experiences um, which is not something that is unheard of, which is as soon as you label a patient DNR, their, their care is compromised. There are some biases that come in. 
And uh, as healthcare providers, not as family members, they relayed to me and the ICU team that they did not want that to happen with their mother. They still wanted to give her a fighting chance. And they knew because they they have seen it in, in their own practices. It wasn't just our institution. It's a global phenomena that all of us would agree exists, is as soon as that DNR label comes into the picture, um, uh, the patient's care does become compromised and we don't provide that same level of care that we would provide to a patient who's code unquote full code. And the, the last uh, challenge that we had in terms of communication uh, was um, in, in, in terms of withdrawal of care versus uh, not withdrawing care, just letting all of these interventions that she already had in place to continue with the no further escalation or therapy in a patient where treatment had now been deemed as medically futile. So the treatment was, was uh, for, for all intensive purposes, uh, optional. So how do we proceed? Do we withdraw? Do we insist or advocate for a withdrawal of care um, where the family members felt very strongly that they were pulling the plug um, and they didn't want to do that and they just wanted nature to take its course. It was just easier for them from a, a psychological, emotional, spiritual standpoint for them to just let things go and let nature take its course. So um, just wanted to share some statistics that are very pertinent to this case. We know that 99% of clinicians they do understand the importance of that advanced care planning, but more than 60% of physicians say that they haven't received formal training and only 14% have actually had these conversations with their patients. And 46% of these physicians say that they were uncertain of what to say in these situations. So these statistics highlight to us very clearly the importance of, of having uh, more training in terms of advanced care planning end of life discussions for our healthcare providers and how to do that. So hopefully we'll be able to generate some a healthy discussion and, and uh, some strategies to address um, uh, challenges related to communication barriers um, in the provision of end of life care. Um, with that, I come to the conclusion of my case presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baka. That was very interesting. <laughs> now I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Agnes Sazi, who's the fellow of the uh, Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. She's currently working as a consultant with Palliative Medicine at Shifa International Hospital in Znava, the capital city of Pakistan. She's going to talk about uh, palliative care delivery to the head and neck cancer patients in community uh, during COVID-19 pandemic. Good afternoon all and another year has gone by and the most important lesson that we have all learned is flexibility in the times of adversity. You all might be wondering why did I choose to bring this patient to our case-based discussion? Let me tell you about her. My patient was a 62-year-old lady. She was referred by the radiation oncologist in May 2020. I mentioned the date specifically because this was the time when we had recently started doing telemedicine with no formal training, hence the theme flexibility. She had adenoid cystic carcinoma left maxilla. She had had partial left maxillectomy in July 2017. At the time of the surgery, she had perineural invasion and bone involvement. Since the bone scan was negative at this stage, the surgery was followed by IMRT, 66 gray in 33 fractions, and this was completed in October 2017. 
She had diabetes, which was well controlled on oral hypoglycemics. She also had hypertension, which was well controlled with her antihypertensive medications. She had history of stroke twice in 2018 and 2019 with residual right-sided weakness and dysarthria. She had had two previous surgeries, a total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral selfingo oophorectomy in 1999 for most likely fibroids and cholecystectomy in 2007 for gallstones. She had been uh, having symptoms of headache and it was a year since her last CT scan was done. So her oncologist decided to restage her. They did a CT carotid angiogram on the 21st of April, 1920. And unfortunately, the finding showed local and distant spread. She had developed pulmonary metastasis, soft tissue density mass along the anterior wall of right maxillary sinus with pre-maxillary extension erosion of anterior wall of right maxillary sinus and the superior alveolar process concerning for metastatic disease. At this stage, the oncologist decided that she was not for any further oncological intervention and hence referred her to palliative care. I'll give you a minute to ponder about the challenges for this patient. So the challenges for me in reviewing this patient were, I had had no formal training for doing video consults. And uh, we did not know when we would start our clinics again and go back to face-to-face -face consultations. So there was this uncertainty and this consult could not wait. I was seeing her as a new patient and we all know the complex needs of head and neck cancer patients. Their symptom burden, the emotional, psychological aspects of their disease and their communication needs. So all this was in the back of my mind. Also, during her disease trajectory, she had met her surgeons whom she trusted because she believed that they had taken out all the cancer. She had a good relationship with her oncologist And I would have to start from scratch without the human touch and without the body language. Reading through her notes, I knew she had facial asymmetry and dysarthria from her previous surgery and stroke. I also knew that she would have to rely on her family to set up the concept. I was concerned that she might be intimidated by technology since this was all new to her too. She knew that she had cancer. She knew that she had had treatment for her cancer, but what she did not know was that the cancer had spread and there was a shift in goals of care. So this was her understanding of the situation. So. I would have to explore the information needs of the family too, because they would be involved in the decision-making process for future management. So this was all in the back of my mind before I got to see her. But necessity is the mother of invention. So I decided that I would set aside a full one hour with no interruptions. Initially, I introduced herself uh, introduce myself to her without the mask and then quickly put it back on so she would know that there was a face behind the mask. I promised myself that I would take as little notes as possible and maintain eye contact throughout the concert. I dwelled on the positives of the video concert first, focused on the convenience of her being in her own home, in her own comfortable surroundings the time sparing and the risks of exposure to infection of being in the hospital environment. Then I included the family in the concert. So she felt comfortable and relaxed. 
I reassured the patient and the family that her care was my responsibility and I was reachable. Once we had introduced ourselves and set off, I did a holistic assessment and tried to focus on her goals, wishes and preferences and not my agenda. After doing the initial assessment and making a plan, I made sure that she has a next follow-up appointment so she doesn't feel abandoned. I gave them my own telephone contact details so she can so she or her family could reach out in time of need. All this was about building trust. I left the discussion for advanced care planning for the next following concept. I sent the prescription by WhatsApp and ensured that she had received it and she understood it. How did I feel towards the end of the consult? I felt immense professional gratification when towards the end she smiled and gave and I knew that we had started to build a relationship. I've continued to see her over the last one year she has given me the happy news about the birth of her granddaughter. Her daughter who lives with her is a school teacher and her school is nearby. So we arranged the appointments around her school schedule so she can be there and set up the consult. And she is my main contact in keeping um, this patient in my loop and helping her through her journey. So this was all about my patient. And uh, once I chose this topic, I thought, what are the positives of telemedicine? In our country, we can use telemedicine to increase access to palliative care. And actually, I have patients from far-flung areas of Pakistan who can easily access palliative care through telemedicine. They don't have to bring the patient to the hospital. The doctor is has access and window to be with them in their own home environment. We can empower and train family members. And this not only builds rapport and trust, but it helps build up community palliative care, which is our vision to expand palliative care out of the hospitals, out of the tertiary care centers, into the community. How can we improve the video consults of course, we need good IT support. The feedback from patients and families uh, has been mixed. Sometimes they feel that uh, it cannot replace an actual face-to-face -face consultation when the doctor examines the patients, addresses their concerns, and the patients feel more satisfied. Some families feel that it is easier because then they don't have, especially for bedbound patients who would need stretcher and ambulance to bring them to the hospital. So continuous feedback from the patients and families can help us to make things better. We must have an out of hour support system so that these patients do not feel abandoned. Coming back to my patient, over the last one year, she has had two or three admissions in the hospital for unit tract infection. Once she had a fall and uh, she had to have internal fixation for her fractured femur. So, I'm, uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is so that the patients who do access telemedicine do not feel unsupported and they should know that in case of an emergency, the hospital is there for them. I read this article after I had seen this patient and it was really useful. And uh, this brings me to a to the end of our discussion about this patient. I would be more than happy to hear your views and your um, ideas about how telemedicine has been. Has it been as challenging for you as it was for me? But to, and how can we make things better? Thank you. And I would leave the feedback and the interactive part of the case-based discussion when we actually meet each other on the 7th of November. So goodbye. And this is where I end. So goodbye from my end. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Dr. Fauci never stop. Now I'm going to request uh, Dr. Aoife Gleason, uh, who's a consultant in palliative medicine at Royal Gwent Hospital, uh, Newport in the UK. Uh, she is also the clinical director of palliative care directorate at Newark Haven University, Alpo. Her research interests include uh, palliative care for non malignant respiratory diseases, um, infection control issues in palliative care, and uh, sexual well being in cancer and palliative care. She is going to talk about uh, the devastating impact of pandemic on communication with patients and their families. Over to Dr. Lisa. Good morning. My name is Dr. Aoife Gleeson, and it gives me great pleasure to present to you on communicating with patients and families in 2020, the devastating impact of the pandemic. I'm going to speak to you about the challenges that myself and my team experienced in relation to communication during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm then going to present two case examples, one of a cancer patient who died in our hospital in 2020, and one of a COVID-19 positive patient who died in 2021, but I will pre be presenting those in reverse order. And I'm going to use those cases to consider the direct and indirect impact of COVID-19 on communicating with patients, with other healthcare professionals and with families. I've broken down the challenges that we experienced communicating during the COVID-19 pandemic into individual, institutional setting related and system related. The individual challenges are quite obvious. The effect of social distancing, the impact of wearing personal protective equipment, the effect of rapidly rapid deterioration. Uh, a lot of the patients died uh, so quickly after developing symptoms that didn't give us time to communicate. The impact of loneliness and the impact of fear on patients and their family members in terms of communicating. And the specific issues of patients with hearing impairment and patients with language barriers. From an institutional setting, I'm considering prone positioning, the lack of privacy, the visiting restrictions that needed to be put in to protect the, the, the hospital patients and also the general public, and the exponential increase in demand for our service, especially during the first wave of the pandemic. And from a system point of view, I'm going to consider the volume of need and the shift in demand, care home and hospital having a greater demand than traditionally um, community and hospice would usually pose. And then the lack of infrastructure, including technological infrastructure, to support the need for change in, in the way we communicate it. So the gentleman with COVID-19 was a 59 year old gentleman who was unwell for approximately 10 days before presenting to hospital on the 1st of June 2021 with shortness of breath and fever. He had a background um, of TB. He was on treatment for that. He had osteomyelitis and discitis, a psoasopsis. He had metastatic renal cancer as well and was re receiving treatment for that type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease, and hypothyroidism. He'd been housebound for one year. He moved from sofa to bathroom only, so had a performance status of between a two and a three. It was documented that his son had tested positive for COVID-19 10 days prior to the admission. On presentation, he had sat at 95% on 60% oxygen and was found to be um, COVID positive. His clinical course, his CTPA showed widespread bilateral ground glass shadowing. He was commenced on steroids, low molecular weight heparin. We were aiming for SATs greater than 90% and it was discussed with intensive care, but decided that he would not be for escalation past ward level. His son had indicated that he had tested negative for COVID-19 and so he was allowed into the hospital and a DNA CPR discussion was had with his son who wasn't in agreement with it, but um, accepted that um, it was a medical decision. And so the team um, would uh, act in his father's best interest. He was referred to our service on the 3rd of June, at which time his SATs were 90 to 91% on 15 litres of oxygen. At this time, he was extremely fatigued and tachypneic. 
His son was fixated on his O2 sats monitor and kept saying, oh, look, the numbers have gone up. Isn't that good? That's a good sign. Um, and from a symptom management point of view, we added morphine and midazolam uh, to try and get his father more comfortable. He was deteriorating when we saw him. His SATs were dropping to 76 to 88% on 15 litres of oxygen. His son, in a long conversation with me, said he wanted the monitor left on because it gave him hope. It gave him hope that his dad would get better. I had a very carefully worded conversation with the son and with his dad, who didn't have, uh, uh, was very fatigued and his English wasn't very good, but his father was able to tell me that he was feeling very tired, very distressed and had chest pain. I gently explored the fact that his father may not get better and despite the fact uh, that everybody was doing everything they could, things may not work out the way we wanted it to, but the son was very distressed. And at this point in time, the son, Public Health Wales had come in um, to the picture and insisted the son get tested for COVID-19 and he actually tested positive. The following day, because of this, the son was unable to leave the hospital, so he had to stay on site and he had to act as an inter interface with his family on FaceTime. And because of this and because the rest of his family were actually COVID positive at home as well, they were unable to come in to visit um, this gentleman. It was very difficult, but with a lot of support, the son agreed to the monitor being turned off. His father was uh, terminally restless at this stage and was becoming more restless with the beeping of the monitor. Due to the public health concerns, um, the son um, basically uh, was having conversations with Public Health Wales, but agreed for them uh, to be the go-between between, between him and his family, which was very difficult. We got this gentleman a lot more comfortable, but unfortunately he died um, the following day. I'm going to turn my attention to the non-COVID-19 case. So this was a 57-year-old lady who presented acutely to hospital on the 15th of May in 2020, at which time she had a swollen right leg, was pyrexial, and she had known progressive colon cancer in the background with peritoneal disease. The working diagnosis at this point in time was a right DVT and a large pleural effusion. Doppler ultrasound scan was unable to outrule a non-occlusive iliac vein thrombosis. Her CT showed bilateral ground glass change, mostly in the upper lobes, large right-sided pleural effusion, small left pleural effusion, multiple irregular pulmonary parenchyma parenchymal and subpleural abnormalities. There was a recurrent mass at her previous surgical site. There was some ascites, extensive peritoneal disease, enlarged groin nodes and other um, pathological lymph nodes. She was commenced on IV antibiotics for treatment of sepsis. She had an intercostal drain inserted and she was referred to our service. Because of her recurrent fevers, pleurodesis was not attempted. When we got involved with her, she had ongoing abdominal groin and leg pain. She was also very constipated with fecal impaction and overflow diarrhea, which she found very distressing. She was seen by the surgical team who indicated there was no surgical options. And she was very clear with me when I met her that she wanted to get home, but was also very clear that this would be when she was better in herself and more mobile. I had very carefully worded conversation with her about the fact that I felt she wasn't doing so well, exploring her CT results and indicating that we might not get her so much better. We might need to think about her going home when she wasn't more mobile, but um, uh, to try and, and, and think about uh, home or another setting where she'd be able to see her family because she, due to visiting restrictions because of the pandemic, was absolutely isolated and on her own in the cubicle. In relation to her progressive deterioration, my carefully um, held conversation, she indicated, well, we'll have to do the best we can. You, I have to get better. I have to get more mobile and I have to get home. With um, more careful support, we, um, uh, she agreed to be transferred to the local general hospital where her family would be allowed to come and visit her. 
So on the 9th of June, she was continuing to deteriorate and she was opioid toxic at this stage. I made some uh, very significant changes to her medication to uh, uh, deal with and, and manage the opioid toxicity. And we transferred her for continued symptom control and last days of life care to the enhanced local general hospital. On the following day and the following day, uh, the clinical nurse specialist who was supporting her spent most of the day with this patient and with her different family members having multiple meetings because they were very confused as to what was going on. Very angry and very scared because they hadn't seen her um, since before she came into hospital. The following day, despite the fact that I was on another site um, and not meant to be in this hospital, I came over to meet with different family members as well. And unfortunately, this lady died, but died comfortably the following day. So just turning my attention using these two cases, I want to consider the challenges that we experienced um, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think, you know, the, the, here are two pictures, one of me where you can see my full face and one of me with um, uh, amber level PPE on. Very difficult to have empathetic and difficult emotional conversations when you're wearing personal protective equipment. While we wore gloves and aprons, um, I wasn't um, I wasn't able to get as close to the patients as I usually would. And often in palliative care, we do use hand holding and gentle touch, and that was obviously not available to us either. But from a social distancing point of view, having very difficult and emotional conversations from across a room from two meters distance was really, really tough. In relation to the gentleman, the COVID-19 positive patient, um, there was a significant language barrier for him. He was also um, very fatigued and developing delirium when I met him, but we had no on-site translators, translators. And because his son was COVID positive and had to stay in the room, his son was acting as a, a translator for his family. That was really tough. His family were very distressed seeing him deteriorate in front of their eyes on FaceTime. So having no sight on trans. No on-site translations was very, very difficult and gave a huge burden to the son to actually communicate everything that was happening. Both patients um, rapidly deteriorated in different circumstances. In relation to the gentleman, he had multiple comorbidities and he, he deteriorated rapidly from the time we met him. There wasn't time for the same graduated conversations we'd usually like to have this was a shock for all. In relation to the lady, um, she had been apart from her family. She was having phone conversations. She was a very independent private lady. So she was telling them that everything was OK. So when they eventually saw her in the local general hospital, they got a huge shock. Guilt, especially in relation to the COVID-19 positive patient, it, the son was there acting as the support for his father, the go-between uh, from them to the family, but the son coming back from university and actually um, giving the family COVID-19 because he was the first one to be found um, to be positive was hugely difficult for him. It placed an extra burden on him and his father's deterioration he felt was um, partly his fault and his death, and that was very difficult. That son felt very alone in that room. He wasn't able to leave. The lady um, who was apart from her family before we got her to the local general hospital, the impact of aloneness was huge. She was, inc uh, well, incredibly emotionally distressed, but holding it inside. And then when we met her family, um, they were extremely emotionally distressed, having not seen her journey through the hospital. From the point of view of the settings, the lack of privacy was a hugely difficult issue, not so much in these two patients situation, but when we were so overwhelmed by COVID-19 positive patients in the beginning of the pandemic, we had two patients to a room, we weren't able to bring in families. If we were talking to families, it was through FaceTime, it was on phones, very, very difficult to have these conversations. The visiting restrictions heightened the emotional impact. Families weren't able to get through towards because the staff were simply too busy to be able to answer phones. Um, 
we had lots of patients who didn't want to, I mean, the pictures you see here, the top one is of our new critical care center and the bottom picture is of our beautiful 15 bed hospice. But we had loads of patients who didn't want to come to the hospice who would usually have jumped at the chance because they knew they wouldn't have their family members with them. So people presented much later with much um, more distressing symptoms and in much more advanced disease status. As a result, we had an increased demand on our services, both from cancer patients where they presented much later with much more complex symptoms, and also from the point of COVID-19, where they presented um, a, lot, a huge volume of, num of, of patients in the first surge of pandemic and hugely sick and deteriorating rapidly. And this ob obviously also inferred an increased need for bereavement support. In relation to setting, I want to specifically look at this Kalman's gap. So this, this gap, the gap between the top line, which is the expectations of patients and families, and the bottom line, which is reality, with the social distancing, with the isolation, with the visiting restrictions, what people expected to be the case um, was very different to the reality. And with more time between when patients came into hospital, and we saw this in particular with this lady who came in and only saw her family when she got to the local general hospital, they didn't expect to see somebody so poorly um, and so close to death. So this, this Kalman's gap has a relationship. So the wider the gap, the more likely the increased morbidity, psychological morbidity and distress. And so, you know, Obviously, COVID-19 has inferred greater um, pre and post death grief, and we've seen a, um, a lot more pathological bereavement. In relation to the system, again, other challenge was the volume of need. We saw a huge increase in, in the need for our services during the first surge of the pandemic. We would go into a 30 bed ward, go into the first six bed bay and find that five out of those six patients with co who were COVID positive were actively dying. So we needed to see um, huge numbers of patients in very short spaces of time. The shift in demand, as uh, we saw that too. So a lot of people didn't want to come into hospital. A lot of people were at home, but weren't contacting services because they were terrified that those services would bring COVID-19 into their houses. Also, from our hospice point of view, even though it's a very popular setting, it wasn't popular because of the visiting restrictions. So people presented much late, um, more much later in their um, disease status to hospital with a lot more symptoms. And in care homes, we saw outbreaks of COVID-19. So we saw, um, you know, huge volumes of patients um, deteriorating and dying in very short spaces of time. Admissions were admissions in crisis. We had barriers to discharge planning because um, with the with COVID-19 testing, um, there was a, a reduced capacity to support patients at home. And also we waited for them to be COVID negative and lack of infrastructure. So from the point of view of um, supporting patients and their family members, we didn't have the technology. It has improved as time has gone on. We didn't have um, uh, from a hospital support point of view, we were trying to support so many patients. We were ringing patients and families on the phone. Um, it took a while for us to actually develop the, the uh, technology on hospital sites to be able to um, video link. And we had limited numbers of uh, staff. People were isolating um, because of suspected COVID-19 um, and people were off sick themselves. So in summary, I hope this presentation has helped to highlight some of the direct and indirect um, impacts um, from a COVID-19 point of view on communicating with patients and their families. In this presentation, I've tried to consider the challenges experienced with patients dying from COVID-19 virus. I've also tried to consider the challenges imposed on delivery of our traditional palliative care services by COVID-19 and, and all aspects of it, from individual to institutional and system related. I've considered the individual, the setting based and the system based challenges that we experience within our service. And I've also uh, considered the impact of social isolating, social isolation, 
uh, uh, on the patients, on their family members, and visiting restrictors, restrictions in the whole service on the ability of family members, patients, and us as healthcare professionals to communicate and to support people in their grief and in their bereavement. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me and um, I would be more than happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gleason. That was very helpful. Uh, so you have all seen the challenges that we are facing uh, in conversations with the patient, especially the emotional and the empathy aspects of the conversation and the visiting restrictions that has impact, uh, uh, has, has brought the impact of the palliative care communication. We have now all the panelists uh, with us. Uh, many thanks for joining us today, uh, Dr. Rawlinson, Dr. Bakar, uh, Dr. Lisa, and Dr. Kazi. Thank you very much. So I'm just waiting if we have any questions. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Atif, I, I do have a question uh, for, for Dr. Aktis. Um, uh, her, her presentation, Dr. Aktis, thank you so much uh, for, for doing such an excellent presentation on telemedicine and, and becoming the advocate for telemedicine in this day and age. Um, I, I wanted to learn from your experience, uh, particularly in the dispensing of prescriptions for medications for uh, diagnostic radiological procedures, as well as uh, laboratory testing. So while we're able to overcome the barriers with video conferences, um, the challenge in the absence of an electronic medical record is how do we get the, the prescriptions to them? So I was just wondering if we could learn from your experience uh, about how we could overcome that and use telemedicine more effectively. Uh, yes, it has been challenging. Can you all hear me? Is, uh, is, uh, am I audible to all? Yeah. Yes. Yes. We can. Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of uh, dispensing the prescriptions, what we do is at the end of the consult, we get the accessible telephone contact details, and uh, I would uh, get my staff to WhatsApp the prescription to the patient or their uh, family members, and. Uh, uh, except for the control drugs, they're usually available out of, uh, from outside pharmacies. So that can easily be um, taken care of. As regards to the second part of your question regarding investigations. So we do have an uh, e-Shifa service where they can go out in the community if they are with local, like uh, within 15, 20 uh, geographical uh, mile radius the team would go and do blood tests and other necessary investigations. But uh, as far as imaging is concerned, they would have to come to the hospital. So I keep that to a bare minimum as much as I can. Thank you. And Dr. Atif, can you hear me? It's yes. Dr. Kashif here. Sorry for unseen, unseen circumstances. I could not be um, a part of Symposium Secretariat today. Um, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, so at, at Shokat Khanam, uh, we have uh, our IT team who's very intelligently devised a system where we can request the blood tests and investigations uh, during the uh, consultation. So we have our collection centers spread across the country and um, they can, the patients can just go pitch up there and have that test done against their medical record number and their name. Um, for diagnostic tests, such as radiological investigations, such as CT scan, MRs, PET, they have to visit the facility. Um, with regards to prescriptions, so again, during the tele uh, consultation uh, note, we have uh, 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 an option to enter their medications. Um, and once we enter those medications, those medications are then automatically texted to their registered phone number so they can then retrieve that list and get that from the local pharmacy.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kashif. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Uh, I think Dr. Iram Bakum has asked, uh, she, she would like to ask the panelists uh, to comment. Uh, what would we suggest uh, for difficult scenarios when the patient has lost capacity and children have uh, different opinions in terms of management? So when one of their relatives wants to go for supportive care and the other from abroad wants to uh, uh, have an active treatment uh, for the patient. So can I, can I ask uh, Dr. Rawlinson to comment on this, please? Thank you very much, um, Atif and colleagues. And it's been a great session so far. So let me give my immediate thoughts and then of course, really happy for others others to join in. I think the first thing to say is it's a difficult situation and acknowledge for us as healthcare professionals it's difficult but also for the patient it's difficult because the patient doesn't have a family that is around them all going in the same direction. So it's a little bit like the collusion discussion we were having on Friday. I think it's also difficult if there is a pressing urgency in making decisions about about treatment regimes or treatment directions. Because in an ideal world, what we do is to use time. What we really need to do is to understand why people have got their different views on the treatment direction. And it usually comes from concern, from love, from unfinished business, from not wanting to think that their loved one is going to take that last breath to have that heart, that last heartbeat. So understanding why I think is helpful for us. And, and it's just then going by the facts of what is in front of you. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? What do I know about the condition of this person? What will treatment give? What benefits will treatment give? What does the patient want? And it's about bringing all of those things together and usually, with a bit of time, what starts as a, as a, as a very difficult, um, fractured, um, disintegrating situation, with time and with listening, you can bring it all together. And if you can, we know that the bereavement, the grief for the family is one spot less complicated than it would be before. Of course, it's, it's grief. It, it will be difficult. But if you can get some kind of an understanding that's useful. So nowadays, particularly if the person is on the other side of the world, it is back to all the things that we've been talking about. The use of telemedicine, not being frightened of telemedicine. We need to get the relative from the States or wherever it is on that iPad, on that phone, ideally with the conversation. They may be frightened about how we're going to describe the treatment options. They may be frightened that we're going to say difficult things to their loved one, and they are powerless to help, particularly in COVID. They can't travel and be there. And that brings all sorts of guilt and all sorts of difficult emotions. So I think in an ideal world, it is, it is using time and, and investing in time, even in the middle of our busy worlds, actually is, is it will make things a little bit easier later on. I think that's where I would start, but I'm very happy for colleagues to bring their bring their experience in. In my experience, time, time and and showing that you're listening and that you understand why there may be different points of view. For me, that's always been helpful. But I'll open the floor up to colleagues, hear what other people think. Can I ask uh, Dr. Gleason to comment, please? I think I agree with everything you've said, Fiona. Um, I, I think obviously the challenge has been in the last 18 months is that is time has been compressed. And as you know, Fiona's commented as well, that you know, with people rapidly progressing with an urgency to make decisions sometimes, it does make it very difficult. And going back to a lot of what Fiona had said in her talk, it's so important. As I loved her slide on listen and silent um, and using um, that community, you know, those communication skills um, even more effectively and more expertly when you're dealing with these difficult situations. 
um, where time is compressed because of the pandemic, because of difficulties interfacing with people, um, uh, trying to develop trusting relationships very quickly. Um, I had a, a patient on Friday, she's got alcoholic liver disease um, and she's hepatic encephalopathy and her respiratory system is also under pressure and her husband so the gastroenterologist asked me to see her because the husband was saying no she's getting better that's it carte blanche that's it drawing a line under it my my wife is getting better so i spent a long time with him on friday afternoon and a lot of the conversation was around nothing we do will prevent her from getting better we're very very worried we're very concerned that she won't but what we're going to do is is look, and I went through every single treatment she was having, and with the ones we were stopping, explained very carefully why we were stopping it. We're not taking away something effective. We're taking away something that hasn't actually helped in any way. And actually he was able to go the journey with me, so long as we took it stepwise. In documenting my notes in the, in the paper notes for the team over the weekend, I wrote out a lot of the language I had used and I said the juniors, the junior doctors on call for the weekend needed to read that because they needed to use similar language because I suspected that she would deteriorate continuously over the weekend in order to bring him on that journey with them and not just dictate to him or say no we're just stopping. Um, so yeah, I think it's, a, it's about bringing people along with you, even if that time is compressed trying to get those trusting relationships quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to, I think, very soon to run a short of time. So I'm going to just uh, uh, add one, one, one more question. Uh, somebody asked, how, how would you overcome the barriers of expectations uh, when seeing someone with that end of life? So um, let, let me just add something to it. So, Say, for example, if the family has got uh, some uh, spiritual needs to address uh, for the patient, so like reciting from the holy book, and you know, there are restrictions, so, and the patient also wants to have that. So, how, how to address that? So, can, can I ask uh, Dr. Bakar to comment on this, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Salim. Um, so we, we've had those uh, um, uh, unfortunate experiences as well. Um, uh, the spiritual needs of our patients, the religious needs of their uh, are being compromised as well. Um, the way that we were able to overcome it, because even if we had the holy book inside the isolation unit, uh, the patient, because of the respiratory distress, the fatigue, the delirium, they're often not able to engage in worship uh, as it is. So the way that we kind of overcame it was initially we asked the, the, the patient's family members to leave their uh, mobile devices um, at the bedside. And then we would have the, uh, the recitations on YouTube or on an MP3 player and uh, continue to play in a loop. Um, the, uh, the problem with that was, uh, of course, taking the ownership and the responsibility for the device. And gradually, we, we came to the decision that in each of these rooms, we installed um, a dedicated system uh, with speakers installed on them. And then we would have any recording, any recitation uh, that the family had requested, we would have it go on um, in the background in each of these rooms. And, and so the, the spiritual needs uh, to some part were able to be met in these uh, very difficult COVID related uh, circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, just another part of this. Uh, say, for example, if they're asking someone from chaplaincy to, to be there uh, during the last breaths. So uh, what can be done in that case? So we have, we have to kind of ask a member of our team uh, to be physically present. And it's going to be very for, stressful for that member as well. So can I ask Dr. Gleason to comment on this, please? I, I think one of the biggest challenges certainly I've seen has been during the pandemic, the number of people who've been dying 
so we haven't been able to access chaplaincy or spiritual support for the vast numbers of people, especially in the first surge of the pandemic. And I think that was um, hugely challenging. Um, the numbers we currently have are more manageable. So chaplaincy support is easier to access. Um, I think there are restrictions, certainly where I work, and I, I I guess I'm commenting on it from a UK perspective, and Fiona may have some thoughts here. Uh, but a lot of the time, the chaplaincy services will have some restrictions on them in terms of who they can see and what parts of the day. I know that at present, because we have uh, an increasing number of COVID positive patients again, we try to see them later in the day rather than earlier in the day. And so for chaplaincy in providing spiritual support for people who are in their last hours um, of life, there are some restrictions from an infection prevention and control point of view. Um, there is, as uh, Dr. Um, Akdas has said, um, you know, the use of t t telemedicine and I, and I suppose uh, uh, video conferencing for support with chaplaincy and spiritual care is also more accessible to us now. Um, but that takes away that um, ability to be physically present at the time. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, with this, uh, I think uh, we're going to end the session. Thank you all for joining us. Dr. Kazi, thank you very much. Dr. Robinson, Dr. Bakar, Dr. Pinson, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.